So we immediately now go to the next and one of the most critical part of the conference. We are going to the panel discussion. So just yesterday, uh, just yesterday, I mentioned to you, or day before yesterday, I was mentioning that you saw a photograph, and you will be seeing the before and the after photograph of a temple. So this is the after photograph of the temple that we are talking about. It's Temple of Vedic Planetarium, which uh, is built at, in Mayapur. It would be so. Why is it one of its kind? I've given a few details here. It will be the largest religious building in the world. Larger than even Sen, Cathedral, Vatican, Taj Mahal, all of these buildings. And it would accommodate 10,000 people at one time. Most importantly, this temple will house a Vedic planetarium, which will have the interface of and where people will be able to interact with and understand the cosmology. So towards this, we would be having the next panel discussion here. But the largest religious complex in the Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Angkor Wat temple is the largest religious complex in the world. Not the thing the false cathedral or uh, yeah. So you know here few comparisons are mentioned. No, no, no. She has to just be slightly corrected. It's, it's just in relation to height and she's yeah. Not so you know of course the details would be with the experts, but uh, I'm sure you know the experts are giving some references only here. But that doesn't mean that it when they claim that it is largest religious this thing, so there is a basis for it. I'm just giving few references, which I mentioned. So uh, the first one um, and our expert that we have here is Honorable Dr. Michael Kremo, Dhritta Karma Prabhu. It's an honor to introduce Dr. Michael Kremo here. He's American freelance researcher who identifies himself as a Vedic creationist and an alternative archaeologist. In his book, Forbidden Archaeology argues how humans have lived for tens of hundreds of millions of years. And uh, based upon the artifacts found in the Eocin uh, auriferous uh, gravels of Table Mountain and at, at California, he attended George Washington University from 1966 to 68 and then served in the United States Navy, uh, is a member of International Society for Krishna Consciousness and Bhakti Vedanta Institute. He has written several books and articles in Back to Godhead, and he's a Bhakti Yoga teacher too. So it is an honor to have you, uh, Dr. Michael Kremo. Okay, we have a, a very uh, short period of time, so I'll try to leave you with a, a few thoughts. This presentation is based on a paper that I presented uh, this past July at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress in, that was held in Prague in the Czech Republic. It's called Preserving Vedic Cosmology. Temple of the Vedic Planetarium is a heritage project. Normally, we think of archaeologists as digging up things from the past to display. But now, 
many archaeologists who are involved in heritage projects are beginning to think of the future out of all of the many things that we have today. What are the essentials that we are going to pass to future generations? So heritage can exist in tangible form and intangible form. Uh, tangible heritage would be something like the Taj Mahal a building and structure. And intangible heritage would be an idea, like ideas about cosmology. And what I'd like to do is give an example of the transmission of a tradition's intangible cultural heritage to the future. Now, the culture that I'm talking about is the Gaudiya Vaishnava culture of India. <laughs> and in that uh, culture, an important figure is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who appeared in Mayapur, West Bengal in 1486. So he stressed the study of Srimad Bhagavatam, or the Bhagavad Purana. And the Bhagavatam itself is an example of futures-oriented heritage uh, discourse. 5,000 years ago, the sages gathered at Naimasharanya at the beginning of the Kali Yuga. And they did, were trying to decide out of the vast heritage of Vedic literature, what are we going to pass on to the people of the coming Ali Yuga, which is going to be so much disturbed? So their answer to that question was the Bhagavad Purana which they believe contained the essential truths that we need today to guide us as we go through these troubled times. <clears throat> so uh, a basic fact about the Bhagavatam cosmology is that the world that we live in, the material world, is only a small part of a larger spiritual reality. And even within that material reality, we're only aware of a small portion of it uh, because there are millions of universes coming from Mahavishnu who lies in the causal ocean. <clears throat> For many centuries, this cosmology was confined to India to a, a certain segment of the population within India. But beginning in the mid 20th century, this cosmology was revived, updated, and globalized through the work of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder of Acharya of ISKCON. And part of his vision for how to spread knowledge of this cosmology to people all over the world was to uh, have what he called the Temple of Vedic Planetarium. And in that temple, there would be in the main dome a working model of the of Vedic or Bhagavatam fifth canto picture of the structure of the universe. And there would also be a museum uh, explaining and uh, expanding upon the meaning of this. So that the museum will be in the west wing of the Temple of Vedic Planetarium. I'm kind of involved in helping plan exhibits for it. So you should keep in mind that this Bhagavatam cosmology is not a, a, a dead fossil artifact of interest only to antiquarians. 
it is a living, vibrant presentation of where we are, what our cosmos really is, who we are in relationship to it, and where we should be going and what we should be doing. And a case can be made that this cosmology has many features that would help solve many of the problems of the world today. It includes the concept of ahimsa, of nonviolence to the earth, to other people, to other living entities. And it also involves promotion of non-material sources of happiness, which is the great only solution to the world's environmental problems. Because if people are getting a higher taste, they can practice voluntary simplicity. And this will help keep consumption of resources at a sustainable level. So I'll just leave you with this thought that uh, Shukadev Goswami expressed in the this canto. And that is that if someone meditates as recommended in the Bhagavatam on the universe as a form of God, they'll have more respect for it. And originally, and they'll be able to even go beyond that to even higher stages of realization. So, those are some thoughts about uh, presenting Vedic cosmology in the Temple of the Planetarium as a cultural heritage project. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite Atandati Prabhu, the Professor Sri Ram, uh, Dr. Aditya, please uh, be seated in the front. And Hari Krishna, Dr. Hari Krishna, okay, please, please come in the front. Uh, and you can get 30 seconds to comment or suggest on whatever uh, the Prabhu has said. So please, uh, Professor Sri Ram, uh, Professor Hari Krishna. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please be there. Please be there. They just give them. Let's if they have any to make. Go. Oh. I open this session for discussion. Oh, for discussion of the um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kriegel. Um, because I'm working with you on the uh, exhibits that uh, will be part of the museum, I'm obviously rather. Uh, tuned in. Um, you mentioned one uh, aspect of uh, the Ahimsa uh, principle that might be uh, presented or might be an effect of uh, persons attending the temple and uh, this project. Have you any other uh, kind of effects that you might feel that it would have ben benefits for the society? Uh Yes. Um, uh, well, I had mentioned some of the possible impacts. Uh, do you mean specifically the Ahimsa principle? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I do think the principle of understanding that the universe has a purpose is. Uh, quite important because most of the problems that the world faces today are the result of people forgetting the purpose of life in this universe. And that is, uh, some, someone mentioned, uh, I think on the first day, maybe it was you, about the, the universe as university. Uh, someone mentioned that, and really, that is the purpose of this universe. It's it's not an accidental universe. It it has a, a purpose, and that's to allow the conscious selves, the souls within 
the universe to uh, become qualified to enter the larger reality of which our material universe is only a small part. So it's, it's an opportunity for people to do that. And if they were to do that, they would solve not only the material problems that society faces, but they would solve a larger problem that we all have being caught up in samsara, the cycle of material births and deaths. Thank you. Hare Krishna. So, wonderful presentation, Prabhuji. Being a civil engineer, I am so amazed to see such a great structure. As Mataji has mentioned, one of its kind in height should be one of its kind in dome size also. Mm -hmm. In your observation, any other remarkable features of this wonderful structure that is coming up in Mayapur town, other than these two, please? Uh, I think it's very beautiful. <laughs> it's, Beauty is one of the greatest dimensions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's to be appreciated that the it's this is an incredible engineering feat um, because it is being built on the Gangetic Delta. It's the banks of the Ganges, the Bhagavati. Um, it is prone to flooding almost annually. And, yeah. um, to actually build a structure of this weight in this area has required incredible amounts of uh, cooperation of consultants, hydrologists. As Karanguru was saying yesterday, you know, we had there we definitely paid for uh, um, to get the best technological advice on hydrology, on the uh, river movements, on all sorts of questions. Um, and even a team from the Vatican apparently came to visit Manipur because they said, we've heard what you're doing here in, <laughs> in this location. And how is that possible? We're very interested to see you. <laughs> your success. In Thank you. So we move to the next panelist. What is it? Uh, you have the next, next panel. Yeah, we have. Yeah, yes, uh, I can introduce some. Yes, yes, yes. So we have the four panels. I know it's very interesting. Yeah. So. Next, next Suppose this, we have Professor P. Hari Krishna. He is Associate Professor at Department of Civil Engineering in NIT Varangal. He is a research scholar with 16 plus research articles published in international journals. He is honored with Bharati Jyoti Award, Best Citizens of India Award, and three Best Research Papers Awards. Beyond civil engineering, his research interest also lies in values-based leadership. So he'll be uh, adding his comments on museum as a display for practical applications for traditional cosmology and astronomy. Hare Krishna. Om Ajnana Timiranda Sanyana Anjana Shalakai Shikshurun Milita Meena Tasmai Shri Guru Venam. First of all, I must confess that I'm maybe the odd man out because I'm not at all Yesterday, Pavan Ishwarabh is telling he is like, you know, in nursery. If he himself is nursery, I am just a born baby in cosmology. But I'll try uh, in this aspect of... Uh... So I have taken a topic because I am from Varangal, which is a wonderful city in terms of archaeology. Uh, I have taken uh, this, past, this aspect of cosmology in one simple thing. Broadly, it can be classified in terms of physical, which takes uh, physics, astrophysics, astronomy, whereas religious cosmology, which takes original stories from religious traditions. I've taken a tradition basically, uh, sorry, uh, basically from South India, Kakatiya dynasty, 
It is one of its great kind in South India and in having a lot of great contribution in terms of architecture, civil engineering, Shilpa Shastra. So these three things I have taken up from this Kakatiya dynasty feature, which ruled in the entire South India almost. I'm taking these three aspects in this. These Kakatiyas have made such a wonderful contribution to their residents, fort, in terms of they can take a circular way of making the fort. This is from a journal. This is the city as a cosmogram, the circular plan of Varangal. This is published in the Journal of South Asian Studies in 1992 by George Mitchell. So uh, he, they say that there are three walls. They have gone for three walls. The first wall is full up with stones. The second and third walls for their periphery are with earth. Mind you, it is mind boggling. They have gone for three great, wonderful structures in this Varangal city, which is Varangal Fort. Ramapa Temple, which is considered as UNESCO's uh, uh, monument and Thousand Pillar Temple. When we come for this fort, it's like a compound wall. We think of compound wall for our buildings. They have gone for compound wall for the fort. Mind you, once you go and see their compound wall, it is so massive. I should say it is massive. They have gone for one and a half, two meters of height of uh, rise of the ground and have gone for stone pitching and they have made wonderful compound. And what to speak of their monuments? They are 20 meters to 30 meters in height, single piece of granite, heavy weight, both as columns and beams and slabs. We don't have any technology of JCBs, lifting the mechanism, nothing. Just they had simple technical issues, maybe with some elephants, something like that, they managed it. And they have constructed this fort. It's really wonderful. Even after thousand years of construction, still it is there. That is the greatness of it. And of course, there are different shapes. What to speak of a single small piece of a, a granite stone, which is very hard. It's granite basalt. Such a wonderful features they have made. This is the greatest contribution towards archaeology from Kakutiyas. And this is Ramapa Temple, which is being addressed in 2021. UNESCO has granted to the it's the greatest monument, heritage project. This is the this is the only temple in India or in the entire world where the name is given for the designer. Ramapa is the person who is architect, engineer, and Shilpi, Stapati. That's the greatness of this person, Ramapa. Therefore, they have given the name of the temple itself. Actually, it is Ishwara temple, Shiva temple, Rudreshwara temple. This is named as uh, on behalf of him. The great art, the Shilpa is so great, you can find in this basaltic granite rock, which is very hard. They will go for chains, like, you know, where we have uh, holes in between everything. So you can find the smallest of all these things. Uh, you can find uh, they have made such a wonderful sculpture, greatest of all its kind. Uh, and what to speak of the uh, dancers, uh, which they have Shilpas, when we dance, the body movements, you know, where the curves are there, turns are there, head movements, everything they have depicted and they have made these wonderful sculptures. This is the greatness of engineering, I should say. They have gone for raising of the platform from the ground around two meters with sandbox technology. Such a wonderful technology which existed a thousand years after its construction. Still it is existing. That is the greatness of this engineering. And the height of it is the roof of this temple is constructed with such type of brick versus floating. It doesn't exude any weight. If you keep the stone, just like in Ramayana, Ramasetu, you have seen uh, Hanuman making the stone as weightless. Just by writing Sri Ram. Similarly here, they made such a type of material which NIT Varangal is working in terms of research. What is the kind of material they have used? This is a floating. So like that they have made. One, one more minute. Yeah. So this is a video which shows also uh, that, that uh, stone really floats in water, on water. This is really remarkable, one of its kind in entire globe. What type of material they use, that is remarkable. Of course, there are some damages uh, to this thousand pillar temple. Uh, there's a thousand pillars in the temple. 
And this is the sandbox technology. NIT Warangal in the archaeological survey of India is going for some remedial measures. We have gone for a technique like granular files, which is my PhD topic for my uh, PhD. I have worked on granular files. We are adopting that one for the renovation measures. We at NIT Warangal, we have conducted some tests and we have recovered that one. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thanks. I am really grateful for the opportunity given by. Do you have any remarks, panelists? I want to thank you very much for this talk. Some years ago, I was giving lectures in Warangal. I was the person invited. That was, that's right. You kept me in the government circuit house. Yes, I remember. Thank you. But even though I saw all these things at this time, it's only today I learned what I was seeing. I invited you for my institute as a chief guest for a function. Thank you. Who is now supporting this? Okay. There is one of my professor, Professor uh, Pandaranga Rao. He has taken a lot of interest in recovering this uh, entire. He is the person who has gone to Paris to present this one to UNESCO and got heritage project. Our faculty, civil engineering faculty, we are working. In NIT or in We are going for remedial measures along with some clients how to recover this damaged. Uh, Kalyana uh, Mandapam, we are doing that first as a consultancy. What is the extent of investment that is going to be Financial things, I don't know. Technical things only we are doing, sir. Archaeology Survey of India, that is taking care of financial. They will ask us the technical information, we will give the technical details. Mm -hmm. Sir. Correct. So I will ask you the in Department of Science and Technology. Okay. For Sri. Okay. Science and Heritage Research Institute. So, I was interested in that. What kind of support the advantage really? For the public, is that why you are not interested in the maximum project? Yeah. Financially, everything RTL is taking care of. We are giving technical advice. What should be done to recover the property? But you must have the project. Yeah, I have the project. Yeah, I'll find out and I'll come back to you, sir. I'll correspond with you. Yeah, I'll correspond with you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker. So, after Professor Hari Krishna, sir. So, Akhanda Dadi Prabhu is quoting the director of the Science and Philosophy Initiative at Bhaktivedanta Institute of Florida. Uh, he is a Vaishnav Hindu theologian specializing in Vedanta philosophy. Um, particularly, he was principal of Bhaktivedanta Manor, a very beautiful temple in London. And uh, he is also a trustee of the faith authority for the Avanti Hindu schools in the UK. Philosopher and trained in the integration of modern science and philosophies of Vedan, Sankhya, and Yoda. So over to you, Akhanda. Thank you very much. Anyway, thank you to all the organizers. This has been an incredible uh, weekend. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed all the presentations and very um, important to me, to um, Dr. Cremo and others in our work for developing uh, the temple of Vedic Planetarium and particularly the museum that will sit within the west wing of that temple, the museum of the temple of Vedic, of, uh, Vedic Planetarium. So in a few minutes, what are museums for? Well, if you look it up, they'll tell you the functions. Basically, what they do is they acquire stuff. They record it. 
they may be presented, they may exhibit it, they may do some research and they try to do some education. Those are the functions. But as we heard from Dr. Kelly and Chakrabarty yesterday, we need demuseum isification, or however the word was. We need to move away from the old model of museums. We need to see them as living communities, as places that actually embody the tradition, that preserve the tradition, that glorify it for the future. And I think that was Srila Prabhupada's brilliance. He chose the pilgrimage area of Navadvi, the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the starting point for the whole Gaudiya Vaishnav um, rejuvenation of the Indian culture of Bhagavatam, of Bhakti. He chose that as the place because it's already a living community of Bhakti, of devotion. He chose Mayapur, the, uh, the place where he could establish a city. And if uh, some of you have been there, you may know that it's from the first day I went there in the 1970s when we had one or two little buildings. Now it is a huge campus with all sorts, with thousands of devotees living, practicing, working, and receiving tens of thousands of visitors almost daily. So it is a living center. And in the middle of that, the focus will be the Temple of Aiding Planetarium. And within its West Wing, we want to have this museum. So we want to, as uh, Dr. Chakravarti said, we want to move from simply um, a museum being a collection of objects to the recollection of ideas. That was a great phrase he used. And that's what we're doing in the museum. It is, the, it is all about ideas. And it addresses the major questions that humans have always had and will always have. And I think, uh, Dr. Penner, you, uh, you mentioned them. Um, is he still there? Uh, yeah, he's there. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you very much. You mentioned these sort of questions. And actually, when you were mentioning them, they follow the levels of progression in the journey that we want to take people through as they go through the um, museum. And it starts with, where do I find knowledge? You know? And really, there's two methods. One is the ascending empirical process that is used by modern science and philosophy, trying to figure out from what we can see, what does it mean, and try and build it up. But there's another system, a descending system. And that is based on the principle that if the source of all existence is sentient and can communicate with us, then it may be possible for to receive knowledge directly from that supreme source. And one of those sources, and we'll say this one, just to be broad, is the Vedas. And we heard also that a uh, very nice analysis um, that amongst the all the Vedas, the key philosophy is the Upanishads. And the Upanishads are summarized in Vedanta, but Vedanta becomes clear to us through the Puranas. And of all the Puranas, there is the Mahapurana, Srimad Bhagavatam, which completely elucidates the message of the Upanishads and the whole Vedic tradition in one picture. So this museum is a museum of Srimad Bhagavatam, basically. It is giving these ideas. <laughs> Thank you. So that, that is the point. It is the museum. It will take people through. Who am I? Consciousness. I am an eternal spiritual being. And we'll show them that from an analysis of physics, of neuroscience, of philosophy. That there is no other conclusion other than I am a conscious being. And what is life? Life, the interaction of consciousness in, as Purusha with Prakriti. And to show how the ramifications, once you understand consciousness, you can start to understand biology. Without understanding consciousness, biology remains a mystery. It just gets more and more confusing. And where am I? In the cosmos. And we've heard lots about how that reveals a broader picture of who I am, what I am in, in this world, and where I belong beyond this universe. And Dr. Primo showed that picture of Vaikuntha 
and at the heart of it was the cold oak. So then it leads to what can I do about it? So the idea is, as Goranga said yesterday, we can't just uh, the UN came to the conclusion that they can't just be science and idea and data. That we actually need inspiration and transformation. So we hope the museum isn't just going to deal with all facts and figures. It will have plenty of information to deal with people's thoughts. And then we hope she knows me got the Sunday. Uh, now I'm firm and free from doubt. Now I'm resolved. Now I can undergo transformation. So we will integrate them with the community, the living community of devotion that is there in Mayapur. And from then, we hope that they will go out back to the world and act for the real benefit. Hare Krishna. Do you have any comments? So I request um, uh, Dr. Aditya Kaloch to, uh, to, you know, deliver upon the topic museum as a center for, um, you know, preserving manuscripts. Uh, thank you. So I think you and I have to uh, refer back to Dr. Kalyan Chakravarti who spoke yesterday about demusification. De <laughs> de so, I mean, museum is no place for manuscripts. Uh, manuscripts belong in a library. I mean, I, mean, I understand, uh, you know, it's meant in the nicest sense about uh, uh, manuscripts in a museum, but manuscripts belong in a library where uh, scholars have easy access and uh, there is a culture of research uh, which goes along with it. So there are many manuscript libraries in India, which are libraries only in name. Uh, they are not even museums where people can go and freely at least have a look at the manuscripts. In fact, they treat the researchers as the biggest problem if you go to a manuscript library in India. I mean, uh, you are the most unwelcome guest. They will be full of worms and insects, which are welcome, but the researchers are the most unwelcome guests in manuscript libraries. Uh, uh, I would say that, in fact, most of the manuscript libraries in India are actually manuscript tombs, tombs for knowledge, tombs for our heritage, uh, where knowledge goes to die. Uh, it should not be like that. Um, we should, I mean, perhaps I'm generalizing a bit too much. There are a uh, uh, few few good manuscript libraries in India. Uh, so the, there are big there are big and small manuscript libraries. Uh, for instance, the Sampur Nanan Sanskrit University has the Saraswati Bhavan Library, which has a huge collection of manuscripts. Uh, the Rajasthan Oriental Research Institute has the centers in Jaipur, Jodhpur. The royal families uh, of Rajasthan have their own personal libraries, vast libraries. Uh, there is a very good library in. Uh, Tiruvannathapuram, the Kerala Oriental Manuscript Library, again a huge collection. There's the Government Oriental Manuscript Library in Chennai. Uh, so there are a number of uh, vast uh, collections of manuscripts in India, but perhaps one of the most researcher friendly is the Theosophical Society uh, Library in Chennai. Uh, they, the researchers are actually allowed to visit, sit at their leisure and actually touch the original manuscripts. Um, and inspect and then take copies. So I think the inspiration uh, should be something of that sort, where the the, the, the the museum or the library is researcher friendly. And it shouldn't perhaps even require the research. There are manuscript libraries in India, which unless you make a physical visit, they will not even entertain you. So and in today's day and world, I think one should, uh, uh, you know, uh, be use the technology savvy and uh, make use of technology. I'll just make another point. There are, the government of India has made many efforts to preserve manuscripts, digitize manuscripts, but it has not succeeded uh, to a great extent, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the National Manuscript Mission uh, and uh, IGNCA, they all made efforts. I think that the inheritors, the inheritors of this knowledge tradition have to take up this task, cannot be relied upon by governments to do this task. 
Uh, so it is only the people who uh, who value this knowledge who need to take up the task of preserving this knowledge. And uh, in that respect, I will say that you know the uh, the the Vedic planetarium has been designed on a grander scale than St. Paul's Cathedral. Perhaps we can also think of our manuscript manuscript library, which is grander than the Vatican archives. So, uh, so, so let us, uh, let us plan it in that scale. Let us try to preserve, digitize the vast manuscript uh, heritage of India in various parts. It can be a task which can be only taken up by motivated individuals who consider themselves the inheritors of this knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I welcome the next panelist. Okay. Yes. You, you mentioned about the National Manuscript Mission. Uh, have you examined this? Uh, and have you looked at this? The website. Website and I also like work I work done so far. So on their website, sir, only 2000 manuscripts are available on their website. Uh, currently, they might have done a lot of work. I'm, I'm sure they have done a lot of work. They have done a lot of work. But uh, what is accessible to researchers is a very small fraction. And what is the status of the rest is uh, not entirely. Okay, okay. Can you look at that? In the sense, then we should, if they are not done, okay. what was told was that millions of manuscripts were digitized across the country. If we, and we ought to know the status of that. Yes. And then, of course, who are the users of this? Yes. What to be the use of this and what should be done for preservation more important for research and what we learn from that. So can we take a project, can we propose a project of this kind? Certainly, I mean, there is a lot of work to be done. And uh, uh, I mean, if some work has been done, we are very happy. It is just that researchers currently don't have... Uh, uh, and what is the plan at uh, Mayapuri? At, exactly, that's what I meant. That uh, it is it is more the inheritors of this traditions who need to take up this task because they are more passionate and uh, motivated about doing this. I'm, I'm so I would be happy to assist in any way possible. Yes. So, uh, sir, just yes. I take a mic. I just update something that is happening at Bhaktivedam Research Center, Kolkata. Maybe you have seen the presentation, and uh, there is a huge library which has been made, especially for preserving manuscripts, but at the same time digitizing what is rightly saying. And uh, you know, the it, it's like a whole after that work is going on, working on manuscripts. Some of the most rare manuscripts are available to see at uh, the RC. God, the... Yeah, so yeah. it's a huge team of researchers and volunteers who are involved in um, bringing together, you know, in fact, first collecting, you know, manuscripts, the rare manuscripts which uh, people have inherited from generations together, then if, if they are not in right shape, they have taken effort to put it in right shape and translation work is also going on. So. So amazing, amazing. That library I have seen last month. My yeah. Yeah. So now Professor uh, Shayam would uh, talk about the museum um, for showcasing preservation of history of sciences. That's okay. Well, I don't have any definitive ideas. Whatever I could think of, you know, the past one hour or so, I just dotted down. Um, I have been to Maya for uh, quite some time back, 26 years back. And um, any visitors to that place, you know, I've seen, I've been there, I was a visitor, and many other people. I mean, in Indians, I said that they are always in a celebratory mood, you know. I want to see various places. He's got temple in Bangalore and in the same God. I mean, it, though it may be a religious place, or it may be another place. So they will be in a celebratory mood. That's a very interesting thing. So now, here I think uh, the museum is a good idea. They should, uh, I think one of the things they should celebrate is the 
astronomical heritage of India. So that is a very valid uh, uh, thing, you know, a purpose for this uh, uh, museum. So now I don't have much to say about the early period, you know, Vedic and uh, Vedanga Jyotisha period, things like that. I'm sure a lot of people will be able to contribute, you know, how to put, you know, various uh, Vedic and uh, Vedanga period and Purana concepts in the uh, uh, museum. I think that will be a very worthwhile task. Yeah, in terms of panels and the pictures and this kind of thing, it's uh, quite possible. So I'll somewhat uh, concentrate on this uh, Siddhantic period, you know, Siddhanta, because that's a very important part of our tradition. So I think um, one should, uh, uh, so that is something not known to people, ordinary people, so that should be, you know, demonstrated and displayed there, like in the major uh, astronomical text in India, and uh, uh, in terms of you know, what kind of uh, content they have. See, people don't know exactly. They, they know that there is you know, Aribatiya, there is Brod uh, Samhita, but they don't know what it uh, their content. So I think that also should be uh, displayed there, what kind of content. So like, you know, Aribata, what does he say? He takes, he talks about uh, the sign tables, he talks about planetary calculations, he talks about, you know, eclipses, he talks about the rotation of the earth. I think those should be represented in that, you know, so that the people will uh, come to know about it. And even, you know, e eclipses, how is visual, what is the visualization of an eclipse? How do you find out the uh, sparsha and moksha of an eclipse? So it's very beautiful verses are given. So I think that should be um, pointed out. I mean, even yesterday there was a very good uh, uh, talk by Poneshwar Das Prabhu. So they said, why not display that? You know. So what does Suri Siddhanta say? Suri Siddhanta he gave a great uh, in detail. He discussed how the planetary computations are done and how the orbits are done. In planetary competitions, of course, I have been doing Siddhant, Suri Siddhant, and many other things. But what is things for you know how to get the orbit? So very interesting, you see. So that will be very interesting people. You see, Suri Siddhanta, this is there. This is the procedure for calculations. And this is what you get. I mean, people may not appreciate the sign function and Shigra and Manda, but they will certainly appreciate the orbits and things like that, you know. So that kind of stimulation, stimulations must be there. And yesterday, there's a talk about uh, this thing also. Uh, so that also should be uh, incorporated in the instruments in our heritage. Okay. First of all, the Shanku Noman, which I talked about, what are the things that you can get and things like that. And there are various other instruments. Okay, so like the Gatika Yantra, I already told for measuring time. Uh, Noman or Shanku for measuring time again. More uh, uh, in a, uh, an astronomical kind of way of finding time. There are various other uh, instruments listed, even in Aryabhata Siddhanta, which is not uh, fully known, but some parts of it are known, like Chakra Yantra and uh, no, uh, Uriya Yantra and so on. That. No, and no, later, no. Nadi Balaya Yantra, yeah, things like that, Kapara Yantra, and uh, coming to Haraka Yantra of Asparacharya in 12th century. So there are very Good instruments, so those instruments also can I think maybe find in some place. And you may think about, um, uh, you know, the modern observatories in India, so why not? You know, that is also a part of our heritage. And there is a big, nice optical observatory in Kaolu. There is a great uh, radio physics, astrophysics observatory in Pune, right? So there are many other things. So that also is a part of our heritage now. So possibly they also could be included in the uh, museum. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Ah, you want to make any comment? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, you are spot on. This is exactly um, what we hope to include within um, the museum. We have a fair bit of space and we can show so many of these incredible uh, facets. We will have to pick and choose the ones that people yeah, have said, as you said, as you said. Yeah. But also what came to mind is 
the idea that some museums can be interactive and not as visual, and it would be wonderful to uh, receive um, a number of the kind of items of calculation. Yeah. You know, we could have preparandas, uh, little pots, little bowls. Um, I think we should have a tailor press, you know, we should have an oil press showing that because that is uh, one of the analogies uh, given in the Bible town. There's all, so if we can work together with you and many of the others and see what items would be very suitable for inclusion, that would be wonderful. <laughs> One more thing is, you know, I was, of course, we have been talking about for a long time, and myself, my colleague Srinivas said, come to the minute, he looked at our planetary model, you know, that's a very good thing. Oh, you know, planetary model, how oh, planetary motion is made. So that is hardly known to be. So that also could be included, some kind of a model kind of a model. I think that should be worked out. And one important thing is that, you know, I think people should, we should, uh, uh, we should concentrate on what exactly the statements that are made in the text, okay? And in the context of that, it's better to do, you know, not imagine things. I think some uh, things are not, not happening here. But many places there are too many extrapolations of you know what has what might be there in our text. I think one has to be careful. I think people will be critical if we keep on you know making you know unsubstantiated things. So only those things that are there, the texts are there, some statements are there, and which have been evidence for that. So that kind of uh, thing must be there. I would just like to say one thing while we are talking about preserving heritage. We should also look into preserving our, this poetic pedagogy. It is one of the one of the gems of Indian history. Is the poetic pedagogy because it it allows one to teach complex topics in a beautiful fashion, which doesn't scare the student. Uh, whether it's mathematics, astronomy, or any other subject, I think some project, some experiment. In fact, I, I always keep saying about this wherever I go. Uh, in fact, I have I also trained some teachers. I have attempted to train some teachers in. Uh, trying to reinstitute this uh, poetic pedagogy, but in the standard educational system, this may be somewhat difficult. But uh, in the kind of a Gurukula system or uh, some such system, which uh, perhaps ISKCON runs, this may be an experiment which is uh, worth uh, undertaking and uh, reintroducing because it has uh, amazing, uh, uh, you know, outcome in terms of uh, educational outcomes. I think, I suspect it will be quite, uh, Quite, quite beneficial to undertake this experiment. Thank you, thank you so much for all our esteemed guests. And uh, I think we are definitely looking at Professor Shriram and uh, Dr. Kolochin, you know, in some way collaborating. I'm sure they will be <laughs> more than willing. Thank you, thank you so much. And interestingly, also, Matt who lies on the 24 degree North Valley. So that's like the point. Oh, 24 degree now? Yes, it's, on the, it's on actually on the topic of cancer. Uh, so I think that that makes it all the more interesting to have something of that kind there. Thank you so much. And uh, I would uh, uh, thank all the panelists and just uh, request uh, Akhandari Prabhu to, you know, give his concluding remarks. <laughs> There's been so much offered and shared throughout this weekend, that it has been as voluminous, uh, and then even then it's just given us a, um, an inkling of the extent of Vedic knowledge, even of what we know of Vedic knowledge. Um, and I'm so grateful to the organizers um, on behalf of the Bacteriana Institute. We played a very small part from our side. The real work was done here by Brink Oranga, Babanisha, and all the, the team. Uh, we're so grateful over down uh, Eco Village um, for hosting this. Um, and particularly, we're so grateful to all our esteemed guests and speakers uh, coming. I thought I would put together a presentation of the 108 best ideas of the weekend and go through them one by one for you now. No, I <laughs> Instead, <laughs> instead, I'll just ask the question, what can we learn by looking into the skies? Well, let me tell you a story. 
Sherlock Holmes, you know, the famous uh, investigator and detective, was on a case with uh, his assistant, Dr. Watson. They finished the case and they thought they'd explore the nice rural area in the English countryside. And there was no place to stay, but they had their tent. They went into this beautiful field in a lovely location, you know, out in the open and pitched their tent, pegged it all out and crawled inside to take rest. In the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes prodded Dr. Watson, Dr. Watson, Dr. Watson, wake up, wake up, wake up, you have to see this. And he said, okay, what is it? He said, look into the sky, what do you see? And Dr. Watson said, I see the stars, I see the planets. Yes, but well, what does this mean to you? And Dr. Watson said, well, uh, astrologically, it kind of means that it looks like Saturn is in Leo. And by the position of where the planets are, I could probably tell it's around 3 a.m. in the morning. And because it's a clear sky, I could probably surmise that tomorrow might be a nice day. And when I look at the vastness, I might ponder my kind of smallness in the whole of existence. And sure, comes with, dear, oh dear, oh dear. No, doctor. The fact that you can look up in the stars means that someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> so here is a, here's the challenge to us. There's so much in our knowledge of the skies and astrology and cosmology, but we have to ground it. As they say, we cannot be so, earth, so heavenly minded that we are no earthly use. We have to take the realizations and the understanding of the cosmos and the purpose of it and what is beyond it and bring that into our own lives and share it for the benefit of the world and all people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I would just uh, request uh, our collaborator, that is uh, Dr. Rajesh Mukherjee, on behalf of Arches, uh, to just uh, give a vote of thanks and request uh, uh, Dr. Aditi to give a vote of thanks on the PRC. Uh, before Shaman, who does the final conclusion and thanks the guests on the other Thank you. Om Krishnaya Vasudevaya Hare Paramatmane Ashe Shakleshanathaya Govindaya Namo Namo Most revered Professor Vijay Bhatkar sir, respected monks of the Hare Krishna order, the learned participants, professors, and scholars who have come to enlighten us from a great distance. The Lord has been gracious enough to bless us, rather to bless our conference with a blessings of a grand success. He has been very much compassionate that this successful has been, sorry, this conference has been blessed with success. To put the things in very simple form, because for these three days, we found profound deliberations, profound projections, and very scholarly discussions. And we are at a loss sometimes that where we are leading to. And you know that the scholars are always in a habit and habit of making simple things very complex. But we and the spirit, whenever we go to the spiritualists, they will they will put it in a very simple form. So whatever I have understood from the discussions 
The adults which have caught can be put in very simple, uh, very few sentences to follow. What is the supreme goal? What is the highest goal of human life? What is the goal of ourselves? Then we must question ourselves that what is the goal? The goal of our life has been very clearly stated in Srimad Bhagavad Gita where the Lord says that Bhavunam Janvaramante Janavan Maham Prabhadyate Vasudeva Tarvamiti Sa Mahatma Sutradha. So the ultimate goal is the realization of Vasudeva, the supreme reality. But the problem is that the supreme reality is beyond the reach of our senses. So, the ultimate reality, the supreme truth, is beyond the reach of our mind and beyond the reach of our senses. It is very, very intangible. But what is the way? The way has been shown by the Lord when he says that Mamayoni Mahad Brahma Tasmin Gatham the Ham Yaham Samava Sarva Bhutanam the Boha. So my Yoni is the Mahatma. The greatest prakriti is my Yoni. And by the knowledge of this prakriti, you can reach me ultimately if you know the Shetra Shetra as well as the Shetra. Chetra Janjami Maam Vidhi Sarva Shetra Shumarata Chetra Shetra Jaya Jnanam Jastra Jnanam Madam Mama That is my Supreme. So ultimately you have to start from Chetra. So the cosmology becomes very relevant. The cosmology very, becomes very pertinent there. And therefore, he's gone along with Anchi's Bhakti Vedanta Research Institute and Bhakti Vedanta Institute. Florida have organized this Conference on Vedic and Puranic and Siddhantic cosmology. So, the goal is to know the religious, the highest, and for that we must know the prakriti, we must know the nature. And to know the nature, but yesterday I have found there have been a number of papers on, number of presentations on astronomy. That means we have another formula there, just Jarpinde, the Brahmande. So, with the knowledge of our solar system, with the knowledge of our Bhumandala, with the knowledge of our art, we will know the cosmology. And through the knowledge of cosmology, we will reach the highest goal. That is the knowledge of Vasudeva. I thank you all of you from the core of my heart, Professor Vijay Bhattar sir, all the respected and revered monks and Sir Brahmacharians of the order, the learned professors, the learned scholars, and the learned participants who have gathered here at our invitation to make it a grand success. I convey my deepest greetings from the very core of my heart. And finally, I invoke the best blessings of the Supreme Lord. May He lead us to the supreme goal of wisdom. May He lead us to the supreme enlightenment. Many leaders to his supreme abode. Thank you. Thank you. So, as Professor Sriram was mentioning, that it is it needs to be celebration and we love celebration. Yeah? So, in Christian consciousness, we say every day. This festival. And in fact, these three days have been a festival for study of cosmology, astronomy, cosmography, and all of the um, valuable fields of study, and ultimately understanding the purpose. So I don't know if we really planned it that way, but the numbers are like one, um, you know, gets of honor, one keynote speaker. You know, uh, four distinguished guest speakers, four uh, detailed presentations from reverend scholars, and eight paper presentations. So there is, there is a math into that too, probably. But nonetheless, it has been almost a Brahman Karikrama. And finally, we come to 
the center, which is the purpose of this conference, that through the magnanimity of the whole universe, we understand the magnanimity of the creator. And when we all lead to this particular purpose, I'm sure the purpose of our human life is fulfilled. So with this, I would like to thank um, all of the distinguished speakers, guests, the audiences. Uh, you know, it has been very interactive sessions all throughout. And so I stand here not only on behalf of Muttevidan Research Center, but I also stand here on behalf of Govardhan Eco Village to thank you all. And as my spiritual father, Radhana Swami, who is also the founder of Govardhan Eco Village, he says, if you would meet you all personally, this is exactly the words that he'll say to you. This is your home. So whenever you feel like, you come back. So please carry this home in your heart wherever you go and come back whenever possible. Thank you. And all the volunteers. Over to, to Shaman. So this is the first of our forays into organizing what I initially doubted that whether we had the confidence to bring together such a brilliant brains and I have realized now hearts also together. And thank you all for making this a success. This is the beginning, and uh, I just have these uh, thoughts clouding my mind that 2022, we have come a long way from, I surmise, 1840s or 1830s could be, where Oxford had a 120 pound sterling, if I'm not mistaken, annual prize for the best refutation of Vedas. And uh, so that was the, those were the seeds planted in the minds of Indians. Uh, there is a statement attributed to Macaulay, probably apocryphal, but makes sense. You can't rule over Indians if you keep them as Indians. At least a few of them saw the, the wisdom in the Vedas. Unfortunately, they chose to discard it. Like someone said, what is there in the entirety of the Vedas cannot be compared to one shelf of a simple library anywhere in Europe. Now, every civilization has its hubris. So basically, what we call civilization is basically driven by trade and commerce. Who controls the trade routes, who controls commerce, they also control in their own way who controls the universe, but that's not true. We here in ISKCON, we also stand at a cusp where should we do our planetarium, all our other uh, exhibits, strictly according to what we read in the Vedas? Then take a literal rendition and there are too many scholars and too many interpretations. No, 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 no. Somebody says, just look at modern science. Look at where they're going. NASA, the Hubble telescope, the, the John Webb, something came up which is showing the farthest reach of the galaxy in HD kind of uh, resolution. But then somebody warns, hey, what if they change their views in 20 years? And yeah. science has this thing of saying that, well, we were wise then, we are wiser now. 
Are we fulfilling the wishes of our rishis, Munis, the sages who had the ultimate welfare of humanity in their mind when they wrote these texts? So, we have in India today people saying, we had everything. We had missiles, prosthetics, artificial intelligence, robotics, everything we had. In our colony, in my childhood, there was a watchman. And if I say watchman, India will understand from what province or what place he must be coming from. So when we would say that uh, these are the foodstuffs available in, here in Mumbai, and he would say, oh, in my village, much better and much cheaper. How's the water in Mumbai? Oh, in my village, much purer. What about the pollution? Oh, in my village, no pollution. So after 10 or 15 such questions, somebody said, well, why didn't you come here then? <laughs> if everything was good, job prospects, employment, money, prosperity, peace, and he had no answer. Sometimes I feel that today's scientists would be asking, not me, I'm not a scientist at all, that, hey, man, you had everything. You had the best of wisdom. You had the best of technology. You did everything. Uh, how come anybody just came and trampled all over you and practically ravaged this subcontinent for a thousand years or plus? And we say, uh, well, we don't have the answer. No, we have to give an answer. History will seek an answer. So, we have to tread that golden mean between reverence for our past and open eye for the future and never land into the hubris of I know best. I hope that Bhaktivan Institute, Florida, and this fledgling small project of Chopati, we gave you that kind of assurance that these conferences are meant for open hearts, open minds. And this is just the beginning. Hope to see you all in much more fruitful collaborations in the future. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Tore, for summarizing it some history. Uh, we'll just take a few minutes to thank our, you know, the speakers, especially the guests personally. Uh, I'll just call the names and if you can please, uh, I think the knowledge you can just assist. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Bhaktarji. Uh, Professor Shri Ranji. Our doctor in age will buy. Uh, Professor Madhusudan Penaji. Dr. Abhite Palachana. Uh, Professor Nara Aitari Ji, for coming down on the way. Nasimhan uh, Pro, thank you for, for walking in peace. Professor Dubai Ji, for all your help. <laughs> Thank you so much. And there's again for, for uh, yeah, uh, Professor Hare Krishna and Pro. And there's a gift for all the participants. So please, while going out, take your gifts.
uh, really more than happy to have you back again. Thank you so much. So please, please, everyone who has not got a gift here, there's a gift ready for you all. Say so, please connect your friends. <laughs> Thank you.